Welcome everyone. We are gonna start with our first session, our keynote by EOS, Leveraging Disruption with Gregory Hayes and Fabian Allefeld. So Dr. Gregory Hayes is a strategic technology development consultant with a strong background in high-end research and development and a focus in materials science and engineering. Greg's professional background began as a consulting materials science and technical program lead working internationally in the health tech, high tech, and aerospace markets. Currently, Greg is Senior Vice President of Applied Technology at EOS North America, where he works to identify market needs and uses of additive manufacturing to develop products to communities. And Fabian Olafeld is the North American Manager for the Additive Mines Consulting Services. He is responsible for leading the consulting team and providing support to organizations that are incorporating additive manufacturing technology into their current operations. In this role, he provides directions for the team's technical consulting and training services that position the organizations as they work with, work with for success in AM. Okay, perfect. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a, an exciting, uh, another Link 3D, uh, 3D event for us to join. Um, we're super happy to be here. Um, I'm not sure what's happening with, uh, with Fabian, but I'm sure he'll uh, join us here in a bit. Um, it occurs to me that uh, a few months ago, there was uh, an actual marathon in Austin, Texas, and Fabian actually ran in this marathon, and I went to the end of the race to congratulate him and uh, uh, give him a high five, and I promised him at that moment that uh, I would seriously consider in the next marathon that he did that I would participate with him. So um, I don't know if this counts, but uh, it counts in my book, so I'm not running in the next one. This is our, uh, this is our marathon that we're doing together. Um, let me just see, Fabian, if you make it uh, say something, because I cannot see the uh, the pictures as I'm giving the presentation. So what we want to talk about today is um, something called leveraging disruption. So we've um, we've been talking about disruption uh, for a long time now. Uh, we've been talking about how to leverage additive manufacturing and today we just want to take you know a little bit more of a deep dive into uh, how we see that uh, that worldview from the EOS uh, perspective uh, but I think it applies um, more broadly to uh, to everyone uh, involved on the left hand side you see myself uh, my name is Greg and on the right uh, there is Fabian um, I think everyone on this call most likely knows who EOS is, um, but just to give a quick overview, we make uh, machines, uh, the materials that go in those uh, machines uh, to do industrial additive manufacturing. All of the technologies that we use uh, use a powder bed technique, so that's either powder polymer materials or, or powder uh, uh, metal materials. Um, most of our machines, all current machines and, and future versions, will be uh, connectable to uh, to a kind of digital uh, backbone. So there are all types of uh, of data that uh, you can monitor uh, how the machine is uh, is printing, what's ha what's happening actually where the laser melts the uh, powder together. How can your machine and and the status of the build job be connected to a digital uh, MES backbone? Uh, something we work with uh, with Link 3D to explore uh, further. Um, <clears throat> we make a bunch of software that goes uh, that goes along with it, and EOS, of course, is, is part of a bigger uh, family, which many of the companies uh, on the call today are either a part of or have worked with uh, some of them uh, in the past. So what we want to talk about today is uh, disruption. Uh, disruption happens, um, and you know, as you're disrupted, one of the topics that we talk about internally at EOS at, at the highest levels of the company is how should we think about re-entry, and, and what does re-entry mean uh, at this moment? We want to talk about innovation uh, as a response to disruption and, and how, to, uh, how to use innovation in a smart way. Some examples um, of what we've seen be successful uh, up until now and then going forward, and then finally some uh, conclusions and um, and hopefully some time for questions. So disruption and um, uh, and then thinking about re-entry. So over the past weeks, you know, um, I don't want to belabor the point. We all know that world supply chains have been uh, disrupted. I 
do not have a number of uh, coronavirus slides in here. I think that's uh, been well covered by other presentations, but it's important to realize that in industry 3.0, um, we focused on supply chain security and what we've seen in the news and, and we're also realized in, in real life. Fabian? Hey, I think I'm here. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. I heard the comment with the marathon and it does not count, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> let's see, uh, let's see how it goes. Okay, so welcome Fabian, glad you could, uh, glad you could make it. Fabian was on the, on the call before I joined, so he's not late, just technical uh, difficulties. Okay, so um, anyway, so current worldviews. Uh, we're in industry 3.0 now. Uh, it was really focused on supply chain security. So locking down those weak links uh, in supply chains. And what we've seen is that uh, there, although you can make this chain as strong as uh, you reasonably can, um, but there are always way, uh, ways for it to break. And, uh, and people talk about um, how can you engineer your supply chain in a smarter way? And that leads into some concepts uh, which exist in industry 4.0. And that's really to be uh, less asset trapped and to use um, uh, uh, manufacturing concepts uh, and and digital uh, uh, digital storage ways to be able to have a flexible uh, manufacturing environment for your company. So if if one uh, portion of your supply chain goes down, it can be you know easily switched and substituted uh, in a different way. The the simplest way to think about this is is a kind of distributed manufacturing network. Um, a more complicated way to think about this is in the bottom right hand corner, you see a kind of uh, supply chain control uh, tower uh, simulation whereby everything is interconnected and um, uh, distributors and production are interacting with each other and not always uh, controlled uh, by the parent company. And um, this does two things. On the one hand, it adds uh, flexibility and therefore robustness to your supply chain. Uh, that's good. On the other hand, it takes away some uh, control that you have over your supply chain, and you're not going to be able to control uh, and set every single uh, price versus quantity graph. Um, and uh, so it's it's also uh, scary, and it's uh, and it doesn't feel natural for some companies to move in this direction. Nevertheless, there's um, there's been a few great examples. Uh, Fabian and I talked about in our last presentation. Amazon uh, is a great one that uh, that pops up. Uh, Netflix taking over uh, Blockbuster is another great example that we always like to use. But in any case, um, this is where uh, we see the industry going um, in one way or another. And we want to talk about what are some uh, smart ways to think about innovation and to help us uh, get there along this path. So if we're going to talk about innovation, um, uh, we cannot talk about innovation without first talking about uh, product portfolio management. And um, the, in the picture that we show here, you see on the vertical axis uh, of this graph, uh, newness to the company. So this is uh, looking at a company's uh, product portfolio. And the bottom would be uh, not new to the company, and the top would be very new to the company. And then on the horizontal axis, you have newness to the market, so low versus high. So if you go to high newness to the company and high newness to the market, then you have um, the top right hand uh, corner. This would be new to the world uh, products, right? And if you have uh, low newness to the company but high newness to the market, then you have you know you've taken something that the company knows and you've repositioned it uh, maybe into a new market and tried to expand. So what you see what you see in the percentages is kind of um, what's generally considered a rule of thumb with how to break down uh, your effort and your resources in the various categories of products that your company brings to the market. And what you can see is that the lion's share of resources should be on things that are uh, relatively new to the company and relatively uh, either low or medium newness uh, to the market. What that means is that uh, there is a lot of innovation, there's a lot of uh, product development, 
uh, that isn't necessarily that you know crazy uh, wild BHAG uh, idea, but it's generally making improvements, uh, thinking about uh, innovating uh, faster, innovating in different ways, bringing new technology into products that you have today to uh, slightly uh, change them, slightly reposition them uh, into the market, um, uh, change the way that you manufacture them to uh, to. Uh, bring your company uh, to the next level. So, uh, and it's always a balance, right? So the, whatever innovation model you choose has to be uh, balanced and paired with your, uh, with your product portfolio of your company uh, for su successful business. And I think that goes probably without saying. Once you have your product portfolio and, and you're starting to engineer how you want to think about bringing your products to the market, you, you need, of course, uh, a model to, uh, uh, to control the flow of your innovative ideas. And uh, what you see here on the screen is a kind of general uh, innovation funnel. This is something that people talk about a lot. There's usually a number of gates, assessment, development, <laughs> uh, test gate, finally, uh, finally a launch. And there's, there's a few different models that we want to just highlight uh, quickly on how you can uh, best think about working within this funnel and, and how uh, companies tend to do this successfully uh, in the past. Starting about um, well, over a hundred years ago, there was basically one known method of how to do this. It was called the linear innovation uh, model, sometimes called the waterfall uh, model, where um, it was a step-by-step -step approach where you went through a, a series of checkboxes, so defining uh, a product, designing it, developing, testing, and finally implementing it into the market. And the great thing about this is that it's structured, um, uh, that the process is clear, and it's also uh, controllable. However, what it what it um, inherently means is that you're defining the requirements of your end product at the very beginning of your innovation uh, funnel, working through, and then you're seeing if that's uh, correct uh, or not. And what that means is that all the requirements may not be known up front. So it's not very flexible um, uh, and it's uh, it's been proven to be uh, you know, a bit cumbersome. This is used uh, largely in a really huge uh, industry. Uh, it's really popular within uh, within government uh, sources, so um, uh, things like military development and things like that. Um, with the uh, advent of the uh, digital era and and software developers uh, in particular, they took this uh, this waterfall method and changed it sh uh, slightly, and and out of that was born agile innovation methods. And, and here you see similar steps uh, to the waterfall uh, process, except um, in an agile process, you do things iteratively. And that, what that means is that um, uh, you're constantly testing. So step four here is uh, really the important one uh, if you look at this picture. Uh, testing your product, making sure that your requirements still make sense, um, uh, constantly innovating as you uh, as you develop your uh, your product, uh, innovating your requirements, so that you are not designing something uh, in a silo uh, or in a back room somewhere, and then uh, two years later opening the doors and seeing if it works or not. This is great because it it allows for constant improvement, uh, fast release. Um, it's also, of course. Um, uh, a little bit more cumbersome because you're constantly improving and constantly changing your requirements. And what that means is that um, it may not be clear when that product is good enough. So you have to really think hard about defining uh, good enough, and, uh, not allowing for uh, for scope creep within your uh, within your product development, uh, and really thinking about how you use this uh, innovation model in the smartest way. There's one more um, uh, model that we want to talk about uh, briefly, and that's um, an innovation model called open innovation. So here you see a picture um, of a innovation funnel again. It's a little bit complicated, so I'll uh, walk you through it. Um, and essentially what this means is that um, let's recognize that not all of our ideas inside of our company will make it through our innovation funnel out into the market. And so um, some of those ideas will, uh, will die, of course, or maybe not be mature enough. Other of those ideas may not be applicable for our product portfolio management. Back to the first slide, uh, thinking about new products and uh, new to the world. However, those innovative ideas could fit well in another company's uh, product portfolio. And so how can we share our innovation ideas with another company's innovation ideas in a way that we both 
we both win. And what's depicted here is a uh, basically a, a, a Swiss cheese uh, approach to the innovation funnel, where you will um, uh, allow ideas to spin out of your innovation funnel. You allow external ideas to spin into your innovation funnel uh, and be flexible and, uh, and work with other companies in a collaborative way uh, to bring the most ideas to the market uh, in the best way possible. This has been um, an innovation model. It's really caught uh, a, a fire, so to say, um, over the last uh, few years. Um, it's really popular uh, in the early 2000s. It's, uh, it's shown great results, uh, but it's also shown to be complicated. And if you uh, aren't confident and don't have a great plan from the outset, it can lead to massive inefficiencies and a distraction from controlling your innovation uh, funnel for your standard products. So um, to be used uh, with a bit of caution. And then, yeah, maybe to, to add to that, Greg, um, and I think nowadays uh, more and more we see that there is no one innovation model that fits uh, one organization. Um, I think what we see nowadays is that uh, those innovation models can be mixed and matched uh, to your number one specific internal organizational setup and also your uh, product portfolio where you can really choose and pick and place out of all of those innovative um, innovation models and really define what makes sense most uh, for your organization itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, tying this in and bring this back to additive manufacturing. So additive manufacturing is a tool in the tool belt of, of a lot of companies. It's um, it can be used uh, to help restructure your uh, your research and development. It can be used to help bolster your um, uh, your product portfolio and uh, to allow you uh, to really have a second look at your innovation funnel and see, like Fabian said, which combination um, uh, works the best. Um, and finally, I think, Fabian, here's where we were going to hand over, right? So you were going to talk yeah. about uh, disruptive <clears throat> innovation. Yeah, and uh, we threw in the concept of disruptive innovation here just uh, because we we think it's a it's a very important topic to mention when it comes about additive manufacturing, but also we want to um, talk about what disruptive what disruptive innovation actually means for a second because uh, we believe that it is a bit overused. Uh, every innovation nowadays that uh, somehow uh, defines a new market or a new target group is called disruptive innovation and um, that is not the case. So if you look at disruptive innovation itself, disruptive innovation has a few key characteristics that we need to take into account when we actually are talking about disruptive innovation and that number one key criteria is that usually it is a smaller company or a smaller um, entrepreneurial team out of a existing organization that has lower resources and with those lower resources is trying to attack a large business or a large organization with a new solution and if you look at this graph then this new solution of a dis initial disruptive innovation is not the same quality or even does not have the same features as the existing product itself. What disruptive innovations usually target is a smaller target group within a market that is underserved by existing organizations that focus on the high-end market where the profitability lays of that market and they try to get in through a cheaper solution that fits a small niche within that market they establish a market base they establish trust within that within those uh, new customers and then slowly and continuously through agile innovation methods they improve their product to a point where it now meets the standard of the high-end market meets the standard of those high-end customers but due to the fact that they have a completely new solution with a with a lower price tag they have now disrupted this completely this market completely uh, slowly without even those larger organizations or established markets even noticing so um why are we mentioning this in this uh, talk today? It is because we believe that additive manufacturing has a huge potential to create disruptive innovations. Uh, Greg, if you want to move to the next slides, um, then I can explain a little bit why we believe that is. So there's three main levers within additive manufacturing that allow for disruptive innovations and that uh, allow not only large organizations with humongous um, 
<clears throat> cash reserves to move into that field, but also smaller organizations. And we can actually see a lot of startups even in that fa in that field, and also a lot of entrepreneurial teams within larger organizations making use of that technology. Something that Greg earlier mentioned in uh, the supply chain part of this talk was asset flexibility. Now, with additive manufacturing, you have the advantage of being able to produce very flexible, small and uh, quick production runs with uh, not having the uh, restrictions of other manufacturing technologies of having to create tools. And that allows you to, if you think about the innovation models, very quickly design new product ideas, test them on the market, receive feedback, and continuously improve a, a new product idea so that uh, you can actually target a new group very quickly uh, without having to invest humongous sums of, uh, of cash. On the other hand, also, if you are a, uh, a, a just starting out with additive production, you will realize that the powder as a stock material compared to other stock materials um, is highly versatile as long as you stay within one um, within one alloy and therefore you can create different uh, products even for different uh, industries within one production run which also allows for flexibility so in the end it is a technology and we'll touch base on that a little bit later that allows for those agile innovations in the hardware space which is quite new and if you look at uh, the waterfall models uh, that Greg talk talked about earlier those are still very traditional in the hardware and product development uh, teams around the world where um, agile innovation innovations are state of the art in uh, of course software production teams but as as just as uh, two week sprints of new product um, product features entered in the software deep development teams we can now see those standards also moving into hardware development teams through additive manufacturing now there is going to be uh, within this am marathon a lot of discussions also about the design freedom and the DFAM, so the design for additive manufacturing. Uh, this is something that uh, is very popular amongst engineers and uh, for, for a good reason because it allows you to create complex geometries and uh, you have an almost design freedom if you uh, take into account certain rules, but uh, it really allows you to unleash unseen opportunities. There's many applications out there already that really utilize this design freedom that utilizes the complexity that you can create to not only create innovations, but also to reduce the assembly down the line within your manufacturing operations and therefore also allows you to create those disruptive, disruptive innovations where you can actually achieve a lower price point because you can take out many manufacturing steps down the road. Last but not least, it allows for rapid innovation lead times. It allows you to print features and parts overnight and assess them in the next day with your within your own teams or with customers. And um, one thing we want to mention here as well is something that uh, is just starting to begin is a completely new generation of talents. Uh, talents that uh, even uh, a few years ago, uh, graduates out of colleges uh, with, with an engineering degree did not really touch base on additive manufacturing. There's a few schools, of course, that taught it, but the majority of engineering schools still uh, talked about additive manufacturing by calling it rapid prototyping. So uh, we see more and more uh, universities and colleges around the world catching up, incorporating additive manufacturing as a production technology in their um, in their classrooms. And now we actually see the first out of those schools having really good ideas on how to use this technology for actual production parts. And uh, for them, we have the opportunity and the benefit that additive manufacturing is not a, um, a technology that has to be retaught. They taught it from the, or learned it from the ground up and therefore have an open mindset. Now, how can we now combine all of those innovation models that additive manufacturing or that are being applied in the software and hardware industry and apply it to additive manufacturing. Um, it's something that we call application sprints. Uh, it is a agile development methodology for additive manufacturing that we've proven many, many times to be very effective to not only create new concept ideas and new concept designs, but also create final application products very, very rapidly. And uh, just like the agile method that Greg was talking about, it all starts with the 
requirement prioritization, or some call it problem space, where we really try to understand what is this one application that we're trying to develop, either if it's a substitution or if it's a completely new idea trying to solve. What are we trying to solve? What are existing challenges in the markets or in the current products that we would like to eliminate? And from there on, we go into an ideation phase where uh, many, many ideas will have to be created. Uh, we have to be open to new ideas. And therefore, we create uh, tens and hundreds of uh, new concept ideas that we then in the first step of our concept phase try to uh, try to conceptualize, try to orientate ourselves, which of those new concept ideas really solves our problem space and can create new new opportunities for us. And then very quickly in sprints, we can design new features. We build those features overnight. We assess them in the morning. We can test them with target groups so that uh, oftentimes within one week, we can go from an old application or an existing early stage idea into an actual feasible product that is printed and the, that we can even run business cases on that and the more you go down that route where you uh, create new features you uh, incorporate them into your new design the less you create a freedom of course because you you lock in certain features but also the more you learn in that process and what we've seen is that uh, the first of those sprints are quite complex and uh, a lot of engineers still have to learn how to apply this new technology to hardware development but we learn very quickly, of course, as you and uh, therefore the next sprints that we can do, then do down the road are uh, are even more promising and uh, can create even more innovative ideas. Yeah. So, um, just to reemphasize that, it's probably uh, one of the most important slides in the presentation. This is a blueprint of how to utilize agile innovation uh, concepts to try to either internally disrupt yourself or externally uh, disrupt your market with additive manufacturing. So it's applying agile concepts uh, to hardware uh, development and it's, uh, it's a methodology that uh, that we've had success in in using. So if, it's a bit complicated, but if there's questions on this uh, on this chart, we can walk you through again uh, later. Um, Fabian, I'm going to uh, uh, move forward uh, uh, just to save a little bit of time. So we have, yeah. um, we have some examples here. Um, I propose that we skip the Evo bus uh, example uh, and go straight to the Siemens case. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that, that's fine with me. Um, just to, to, to give people one sentence about Evo bus, uh, Evo bus, why did we uh, throw that example in there? Because it is one of the leading organizations that was able already before the COVID crisis to create a agile supply chain by creating a digital inventory by utilizing additive manufacturing. So they produce already today more than 200 spare parts on demand and continuously increase that amount. So it's a very, very interesting case study to, to show people that a digital inventory is not, uh, not an idea, it is already in practice. Yeah, also low cost parts, right? These yeah. aren't uh, um, the high value dollar parts. Okay, Siemens. Um, so Siemens is a great example on uh, an organization that started out with uh, utilizing additive manufacturing for some internal operation uh, complexity reduction. But then while learning uh, additive manufacturing through those MRO operations, they now utilize additive manufacturing on a daily basis to innovate new products. Um, from MRO, so uh, very interesting uh, case that uh, Siemens identified years ago was that their burner tips that go into their gas turbines that, uh, of course, inject the gas into the gas turbines to then create energy uh, burned off. And those repairs of those burner tips were very costly and very uh, time consuming. It took uh, more than three months to create a new burner tip. And uh, that, of course, is not only a, a big cost driver, but also creates some uh, potential uh, challenges in supply chains in, uh, of, of, of the energy production because if I don't have a burner in my gas turbine, I cannot run that gas turbine. So a lot of uh, pressure on that one part. And what Siemens did is that they did decide to not repair those in a traditional method, but use additive manufacturing by grinding off only the the upper surface of that application and then 3D printing a new structure on top of that. And uh, why is that so, so interesting? It is because uh, they are substituting an existing part and moving into additive manufacturing with a, with a solution that not only 
allows them to repair those burners better, but also by uh, reducing their internal cost and really solving a challenge internally to get a broad buy-in for LF manufacturing. Now, once they were successful with that case, which they were years ago, they continued to use additive manufacturing for, for other applications. And uh, then the agile methodologies come in where they're now in a position where they can reduce the development time of new applications by 75%. I mean, 75% is a huge driver, not only in competitive advantage, which really gives them the opportunity to release new products quite rapidly, but also the reduction of lead time of products to their customers. So a double win on that side. Um, and of course, if I utilize additive manufacturing, as I talked about earlier, also from a design perspective, I can now increase my performances uh, significantly because if I make use of those complex structures, I incorporate those into my new designs, uh, I can really get ahead of my competition. And I think the reason why we chose this example is because you don't always have to start with the new disruptive innovation. Uh, those are quite complex to get to, and uh, it is a long journey to uh, create those completely new applications and test them out in the market. I could also start quite easily with a substitution, with a challenge I have within my supply chain, try to solve this challenge through additive manufacturing. And then within those learning processes that I, that I go through by developing an application, I can then move myself into more innovative applications that really have a disruptive um, uh, characteristic. And uh, just to quote Siemens, uh, if you can print a turbine blade, you can pretty much print anything. Uh, that is a big uh, statement, and it is also a true statement. I mean, if I if I am able to to really create those those performance factors within a three D printed part, then I can really really change markets uh, in in any other industry. And here we have a few examples that show that disruption is on the horizon. We uh, we. Uh, purposely picked a few smaller organizations that are trying to attack existing markets. On the upper left, we have Launcher, which is a organization that uh, produces liquid, um, liquid gas combustion chambers that uh, you know, is now able to create a rocket that, that can send smaller cargo into space where large organizations like the SpaceX's and the, the Boeing's aren't of course interested, but um, over time, Launcher has the potential to move into those new markets by continuously optimizing their technology. We have uh, Atrex, which is a orthopedic insole company that now 3D prints those insoles by utilizing existing 3D scanners that are uh, in many, many shoe shops uh, around the nation. And uh, they are now targeting the orthopedic market where their solution is very low cost and widely accessible to, to, a, to a market that uh, wouldn't even consider going into orthotics uh, and, or orthopedic insoles. We have Conflux, which is a heat exchanger organization that is able to customize high performance heat exchangers for uh, applications that usually have struggled incorporating bulky heat exchangers. So again, targeting a a group that uh, hasn't really uh, had access to those high performance heat exchangers. And last but not least, Fitz Frames, a glasses company that focuses on customized glasses for initially a target group that was completely underserved, uh, children who uh, have a huge struggle picking out glasses. I remember from my from my young ages when I had to pick out glasses, I hated it. So um, again, moving into a new target group with a low cost, solution that uh, other organizations aren't targeting at all. And then they, of course, have the, the opportunity to move into those mainstream markets. I mean, who doesn't want a customized glass uh, with, with, with pres prescription lenses that is lower cost than the standard glasses that we can find on the market? So um, a lot of disruption on the horizon. We'll have to see who actually turns into an actual disruptor. But we believe that uh, there is examples out there that already show that potential. Awesome. So uh, I think we need to probably wrap up here uh, relatively soon. Fabian, do we mm -hmm. want to uh, let's maybe end with this slide. With that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think 
if you are in a position where you realize additive manufacturing is a, a potential lever for you, whether because your supply chain is disrupted and you realize, hey, maybe additive manufacturing can help out, or if you are in a position where you think, okay, innovation and disruptive innovation uh, could help us to really gain new new markets and gain more profitability. There's a few methodologies that we've learned uh, down the road and over the past years that help you to identify that one use case where additive manufacturing actually adds value. And uh, from our experience, it all starts with exposing pain points. There is uh, no no reason to create a new solution where there is no pain points. Uh, solving pain points has two benefits. Number one, if it's a pain point within your consumer group, you have their attention. And number two, if, there's, if it's a pain point within your supply chain, you have the attention of your uh, critical stakeholders in your organization whose support you will need down the road. So exposing those pain points is a huge step to really understand how can we can we move forward. And then the, the second very important step is, of course, creating value add. Creating value add, whether if it's in your supply chain or to your customer, uh, oftentimes additive manufacturing, if we just look at the production cost itself, it might be more expensive than a casting application. But then if we take into account that we reduce lead times, that we reduce innovation times, that we are able to, um, for example, get rid of uh, minimum order quantities or last time buys, all of those factors sum up into a net value add of that application where all of a sudden we're actually creating value and uh, and we're contributing to the bottom line of our of our organization and once i've uh, identified that as well then i can go into certain product portfolios and product ideas where i can understand within those portfolios i have pain points that i can solve through 3d printing i can actually create a value add through 3d printing now let's grade certain parts within that portfolio where we can not only of course uh, create a technology fit which means we can 3d print it or we can even add uh, performance through 3d printing but also what's the value add what's the economic fit and uh, best case we of course want to start out with an application with a part that we can then send through the innovation sprints that already from my initial understanding creates economic value but also creates uh, technological value so Go through that uh, uh, that uh, methodology by yourself. If you need help from from EOS, we are we're happy to support. We have a team that focuses on a daily basis on identifying those pain points and translating them into use cases and opportunities. But uh, I think it's a good, great uh, three step approach to get started. Yeah, no, exactly. And um, <clears throat> if I just if I think back uh, to some of the presentations that we've given over the past couple of weeks, Fabian, you know, it's um, we've been talking for a long time, years, really, about uh, supply chain innovation and, and supply chain disruption. And it was kind of people heard it and they uh, they thought about it, but it's not until it happened in the last weeks uh, that everyone seems to be like, oh yeah, this is uh, this is how uh, we can do it. And these are some of the changes we can make to uh, to really secure our business. And the, and the next step there is what we try to present today is thinking about, you know, what innovation models uh, do you use and, and how do you control your internal uh, development processes? And you can use additive to do that uh, in a better way uh, as well. And so hopefully, um, uh, hopefully some people uh, hear this, it, it resonates, and, and they're able to take uh, the next uh, step. Um, okay. So we have a few questions in our Q&A, so we can go ahead and start on those. Okay. Um, so first question, with the most votes, how do you achieve repeatability and final part with tolerance in case of Siemens turbine blade? <clears throat> hey, do you want to answer or should I? Go for it. You talked about the Siemens case. I'll jump in there. Okay. Okay. So with any additive manufacturing part, there is of course a uh, qualification phase included. I don't go from a initial innovation uh, sprint right into production. So uh, with our customers, we go through uh, what's in the medical industry called a OQPQ process, where of course after a installation qualification, we go through a machine capability analysis where within our build volume we really try to understand uh, where are certain um, certain certain parts of that uh, build volume and uh, what kind of tolerances do they produce we really try to get a, a really good understanding and then within the 
um, machine capability analysis, we try to take out uh, influencing factors such as different part of lots, such as different operators to really understand what are the actual capabilities of our system. Um, that is application in unspecific. And then we go through a performance qualification where we build uh, several parts of that final application. There's a lot of testing involved and we uh, we then map the capability analysis with the final part analysis to, to make sure that we have a reproducible process. On top of that, there's of course working instructions and the process FMEAs that all need to uh, be created in order to have a robust quality management system behind that that is really customized for out of manufacturing. Thank you, Fabian. The next question, how does the efficiency and fidelity of manufactured parts a thousand plus products fit into the development of these agile methodologies. How does the efficacy and fidelity of manufactured? I'm not sure I understand this I question. Uh, I think I think what what the, what what Nathan means is how does uh, agile innovation and zero production fit together? I think what we need to what we need to uh, understand is number one, agile innovation, of course, has one product at the end that is then in a way locked in and will be produced over time. Um, but uh, what we also see uh, coming up more and more is so-called um, parametric driven design where I don't even design a final application and design an application with certain parameters and now customer, customers can customize those to their liking and I produce, uh, I turn those customizations of parametrics into a final design that can then be printed. So there's even innovation down the road after I move into production. Yeah, and, and when it comes to um, a thousand different products, you know, looking at a product portfolio, additive can be used in a very flexible way there to, to address, you know, some of the longer tail. And we talked about that a few weeks ago um, uh, as well. Perfect, thank you. Another question. Would you like to give any update on laser profusion technology, which can revolutionize the AM market? Um, sure, so uh, laser profusion is a, um, is a light engine uh, technology. Um, we announced it, I believe, a year and a half ago uh, now. Um, it will be uh, coming to uh, the market in the in the future. I think with um, uh, with the, with the current uh, in environment, it's it's hard to tell uh, exactly when. Uh, but we are still internally on track uh, for delivering in 2021, which is uh, which is what we said um, uh, a while back when we when we announced it. The most important thing to to recognize about laser profusion is it uses. Um, uh, multiple thousands of, uh, of different uh, energy sources, uh, which can uh, be strategically uh, put onto the powder bed itself. So it allows things like um, uh, a rapid process. Um, it has the, the benefits of having a more controlled uh, thermal uh, uh, regulatory uh, process in the build chamber um, it is uh, it is a manufacturing technology which is uh, then you know going to have a cost associated uh, with that but um, we're excited about it it's uh, it's something we work on uh, a lot and um, and are pumped to bring it to the market so yeah with stay tuned i guess i should say awesome well thank you greg and fabian so much for joining us today um, Look forward to meeting you in the virtual networking rooms if you choose to stay. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, Thank thanks you. a lot. Thanks again to Link3D for hosting this. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Have, have fun, everyone. <laughs>